access the material um, regarding this oh, class. Yeah, right. But before you get into that material, uh, I have a couple of questions because we're going we're going to be starting in on some of the details of Kabbalah, uh, which we have not yet uh, advanced on in this class. Uh, so the, the, the first question I want to throw out is, how do religions bridge the gap between God and human beings? How do we bridge the gap between God and human beings? With prayers. Prayer is one way. Of course, you know, for some people, that doesn't really bridge the gap because, you know, it's, there's an old joke about that, uh, you know, uh, back in the days when there were phone booths, a, um, you know, a, a Hasid is in, in an airport and he, uh, he needs a place to daven mincha. So, you know, without attracting a lot of attention, what does he do? He goes into a phone booth and he starts <laughs> davening into the phone. And the question, of course, really the punchline to the joke is, is there someone at the other end? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, you know, prayer is one way to bridge the gap, but, you know, it, it, it has its limits, right? Because most of us who pray don't often get a direct response, right? Okay. Hey, what other ways do we use to bridge the gap in religion? Yeah, so, uh, oh, okay. So I think it's kind of more, more than prayers. So religion is kind of like it shows the way. And I remember like when um, Moses asked Hashem, show me your ways, okay, in uh, Ki Tisa. I'm, I'm happy I'm saying right. So really it's like, Religion is supposed to be more showing the way of how to get close to God by, in our, in our case, the commandments and the way of uh, to, to do things, commandments and reading the Torah, learning how to approach God. Yeah, so, you know, Moses says to God, Hareni na et kavodecha, show me your glory. Hmm? So, hopefully the the way of religion whatever religion it is shows us the way to god to connect with god to bridge the gap and for us you know, how do we experience that it's through the torah the torah is meant to be our understanding of god's word and god's way <clears throat> therefore having that helps us to bridge the gap um, how else do religions bridge the gap? Well, we become closer to God when we do mitzvot. Okay. So hopefully, you know, when you do something that is truly a mitzvah, you feel closer to God. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's also kind of an, ex, an extension of how Torah functions as a way of bridging the gap. How does Christianity bridge the gap? Accepting Jesus as the Messiah. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, that's pretty direct. And of course, that's <clears throat> one of, you know, one of the problems we have is that we don't have it as direct a way as Christianity. We might say, well, that's not legitimate. It's not correct. But, you know, if you think it's correct, then, you know, it works for you. Mm -hmm. It does. We don't have something quite that intense. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other ways that are more successful for 
you or for other Jews that you know? For us to feel close to God or to uh, feel that God is close to us or both? Is it the same? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, experiencing miracles in, in our daily lives and in the unusual, perhaps, sense that sometimes an unusual miracle occurs. Right. And if you experience it as a miracle, then it works. And that bridges the gap. Mm -hmm. um, are there ways that are more successful for you? I think, I think we're already making good deeds. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Making good deeds, making good for other people. Right. Not, you not do only something good, good, you do something good, and, and that's going to, um, <clears throat> that's going to make you feel closer to God. Right. So that works for many people. Um, um, so, you know, just to be clear, nothing works for everybody. And therefore, religion tries to foster many different ways to connect with God. So, uh, Kabbalah is going to provide a more intense way than just through performing good deeds or learning or living out the way of the Torah. Um, and this is, you know, part of what I described back in the very first session of this class in the fall uh, as mainline Kabbalah, um, which um, it provides the Kabbalistic practitioner with a view into the inner life of God. So I, I would, you know, compare this to someone you love and whose inner life you have some understanding of. And that gives you a window into who they are, what they want, what they want to accomplish, what they want you to do, in the, you know, in whatever realm you're connected. Same thing for God. If you have a peek into the inner life of God, that gives you a way to connect with God and to help God fulfill God's purposes for the world and even for your own life. Right? Uh, so if you you know, we're going to talk about the, um, the Sfirot, the different images <clears throat> that flow from the infinite, from the Ain Sof, um, into our material world. Um, they are just, you know, different aspects of God. Um, uh, there are different theories in Kabbalah about, you know, different schools of Kabbalah um, about what exactly these spheroes are. But the process of the spheroes, the process of the emanation of the spheroes is, is really language for God making itself accessible to us here in the world. Um, sort of assumes a flow of energy from God into the world, uh, which is similar to some of the other mystical systems that uh, exist, especially <coughs> in the West. Now, um, we've spent a little bit of time in this class talking about some of the problems of Kabbalah. Kabbalah gives a system of 10 spherot, 10 different emanations of God into the world. So, you know, we Jews 
believe that God is one, right? So if God is one, how can there be 10 different spherot, 10 different aspects of God? So the answer I would give to this is um, every one of you in this group is one person. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of people I, I don't know how to identify uh, other than by the name of your iPad, but, but I know you're there, right? And each one of you is one person, right? You're one unity, but you have many different qualities, many different aspects and concerns, right? There are many parts of you as an individual, but you are still one person. God, being God, has the capacity to incorporate many different qualities and, and show different manifestations. Um, and that can be described in many ways, with many symbols. And yet still, God is one unified being. Right? Um, some people have speculated that because the Catholics worshiped God through the Trinity, through three aspects of God, the notion of the Sphirot might have been influenced by uh, the church. Um, it's possible, but I think that, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot of outside influences that may have come about and worked their way into the system of Kabbalah. But but the idea of God manifesting God's characteristics to us and, and in so doing, making it possible for us to feel closer to God, to feel love for God, that idea is very strongly rooted within the Tanakh, uh, within the rabbinic tradition. Um, but ultimately, every religion has to have ways to help us bridge the gap between us and God. Um, and the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, expresses the faith of the prophets that God cared enough to reach through the gap and to um, address us directly. Um, and the rabbis certainly believed that, that it was very critical for us to, uh, to affirm God's reality. And so I take a couple of texts here at, at the very beginning, which illustrate this impulse in our rabbinic tradition long before Kabbalah came into being starting in the 12th century. So in your texts, take a look at uh, this, the, these two texts in number one, the first piece from Sifre, which says, it quotes the verse from Isaiah, so you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. And the rabbinic interpretation of that is, when you are my witnesses, I am God. But when you are not, I'm not God. In other words, without our witness, it is as if God is not present. We actually make God God. And so God needs us in order to fulfill a role. And that is a notion that we will see in some very important ways later on in this course uh, that, that are extremely central to, uh, to Kabbalah. Um, this is just a, you know, a small step in the direction which uh, the Zohar is going to uh, take us. Uh, a little bit later this morning. Mm -hmm. um, then the second text. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it written in Leviticus, va'asitem otam, you shall do them. And then it says, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. And the, the answer to that is, he who fulfills the mitzvot of the Torah and walks in his paths, as it were, creates him above. The Holy One, blessed be he, says, it is as if 
he created me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, o- Otam and Atem um, both have the, um, the same letters. Mm-hmm. So, um, th- that, that's the basis for this rereading of the biblical verse to say that, that human beings actually create divine forces. Um, you know, it's like, you know, we continually renew creation um, through, um, you know, this kind of recreation of God um, through uh, actually uh, declaring God to be God. Right? Lou, yes, you have a question. Yeah, a couple. Um, so let me uh, first ask about the, um, the first text from Isaiah. Uh, not the text itself, but the explanation of the rabbis. Yes. When, you're, when you are my witnesses, I am God. And when you are not my witnesses, I am not God. I can't buy into that. God is God. Um, maybe when you're not a witness, you're not connecting to God or you're not understanding God, but God's still God. Yeah, except that maybe you don't perceive that. I mean, you know, for for the you know, for certain people, God is God. You know, even if I don't think about him, even if I don't necessarily follow God's rules for others, you know, this is this is what it takes to make God real within the world. Or within them. I mean or within you know, them. God God is still real within the world for the rest of the world. Right, but but uh, the the impulse, the mystical impulse, says, uh, if you don't make God real in the world, then it's as if there is not God. For you, or beyond. Well, I don't know that God would withdraw. Um, Maybe God does withdraw. Well, let me save comment on that for when we deal with Lurianic Kabbalah next year and deal with um, the concept of Tzimtzum, of God's withdrawal. Maybe God withdraws uh, such that it requires our witness for God to be real within the world. All right. If uh, if I can ask another, and going back Please. to the question about uh, can can God exist in ten sphere road if God is one, I I I would think that the essence of God is still one, regardless of how many ways God shows Himself to us. Um, uh, if the essence of God is Ein Sof, we'll never know that anyway. So. Um, we see God and experience God in many ways, uh, and whether it's limited to 10 or not, uh, I don't think it's limited to 10. Um, I think there's much more, and I have a whole theory, which I spoke to you about a couple of weeks ago. But uh, uh, the idea of limiting uh, God to one um, uh, understanding of God is limiting God, and I don't think God is limiting. I think God is limitless. Mm-hmm. So uh, I would suggest that you treat the Kabbalistic approach with Ten Sfi wrote as a hypothesis and not as an absolute fact. Do oh, I don't. <laughs> take it as a hypothesis about um, how God enters the world and enters our perception and understanding. Does it help to think of it that way? Um, well, I have problems with the Sphero uh, well, model. Well, and, you know, we, we will all have problems with one aspect or another of the mystical tradition, just as we're all likely to have some problem with, with 
some aspect of Jewish thought and belief. If, if we don't have a problem, we probably haven't been thinking enough about it. Agreed. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, my goal through all of this is not necessarily to persuade, but to explain. Okay? Okay. So, next text. Mm -hmm. And this comes from Shnei Luchot Habrit, um, uh, a work which, for those of you who haven't heard me talk about it before, uh, was uh, written in 1625 by uh, one of the great medieval mystics, Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz. Um, and to uh, answer the question that might be on some of your minds, uh, the answer is yes, uh, I am a descendant of this rabbi. I just don't get any royalties on the sale of his works. So sorry about that. Um, but his work was an encyclopedic book, everything Jewish up to 1625, through a Kabbalistic lens. Um, here is, um, is what he says. And, and some of you may remember, we, we, we may have looked at this very briefly back in the opening session in the fall. Here's what he says. The tzaddik below arouses the tzaddik above. Both are established and make the supernal glory and increase its strength, one from below and one from above. The tzaddik who is above becomes strengthened when there are tzaddikim, righteous ones below, who increase his power in accordance with the secret of this verse from Psalms, you know, uh, um, ascribe strength to God. But the, the word, the Hebrew word in the verse is tain, it's give. Okay? So give strength to God. How does one make God stronger? I mean, you know, if you believe that, that God is, you know, ultimate power, how do we give strength to God? So the answer given here is the tzaddik below arouses and assists and empowers the tzaddik above. Okay? So this is a view that is not based on our experience. It's about God's experience. You know, the, the job of the mystic in, in this view of Kabbalah the job of the mystic is to operate within the Sfirot in such a way as to strengthen God, right? uh, to affect those higher levels in certain positive ways. Um, now, you know, some people will say, well, you know, religion, how does religion help me? You know, what does this do for me? Kabbalah says, don't think about what it does for you. That's almost like being selfish, right? It's not about you. It's about God. It's about what God needs. Our job is to help God, not to, to help ourselves, not to ask, you know, what religion does for me. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the project of life, in the view of the Kabbalists, is to either to restore or to establish a certain harmony in the realms up above, right? in the cosmos, right? And how do we do that? We do it through ritual, we do it through moral activity and good deeds accompanied by the right kind of thoughts, the right kinds of contemplation. Right? Um, and that's how we animate the life of the upper realms, the spherot. And that brings a certain flow from the upper world into the lower worlds, 
and to sus ultimately to sustain our world. Um, some people might ask about this, you know, so when we pray, can we really pray for individual needs? You know, whether there are our needs or, you know, other people's needs, because, you know, after all, that's a significant part of prayer. Um, and what does that have to do with strengthening God? So the answer to this is we do have prayer for others. We do have petitionary prayer. But at the deepest levels, uh, those needs for which we pray are not just our own needs. They are also needs of God. In other words, if I know someone who needs healing, God knows that also. And that need for that person is also a need of God. Um, down the road, we'll, we'll look at this uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay. Now, uh, yes, <laughs> thank you, Lou. Uh, ask not what God can do for you. Ask what you can do for God. Uh, that's a good way of putting it. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, it, it, does anybody have any other comments, questions, observations at this point? Feel free to speak up. <clears throat> Rabbi. Yes. Richard, Rabbi, uh, <clears throat> you just made a statement that I that reminded me from, uh, you know, President Kennedy and so forth. And yeah, that was Lou's contribution, not mine. Well, okay. You just made the statement. Uh, ask not what God can do for you. And yet in our Amida, I can't count the number of prayers where we ask God to do things for us. God bless the righteous. God bless the pious. Uh, God uh, uh, heal uh, all those who are sick. I mean, we ask God in our, uh, our standing prayer uh, and throughout our, our liturgy to do things for us. Yes. Where that with what you just said. Um. Well, I won't try to square it completely. Uh, what I will say is, you know, the, the, the Kabbalistic answer is that I ask God to do those things because in addition to being my need or the need of the other person, they are also a need of God. That's the ultimate answer. Uh, and I have just one follow up. Sure, Richard. Uh, we're making a, I, I hear what you say and I can believe it. The only problem I have in believing it to have, to have some vitality, to have some merit is Okay, speak up just a little bit. It makes a number of assumptions uh, and presumes God uh, in a quite an anthropomorphic form. And, uh, and consequently, I, I'm really concerned about the extent of anthropomorphism uh, in, this, in, in this discussion. Can you comment on that, please, sir? Yeah, I don't think it has to be seen as an anthropomorphism, um, I mean, or at least no more so than standard rabbinic Judaism. I mean, what is it? What do we mean to say if we say, God, "You, God, are shomea tefillah," you hear prayer? Well, that's a metaphor not necessarily a physical statement. It doesn't mean that God has ears and hearing in the way that human beings do, do. Right? Yep. Does that help a little bit? <laughs> well, if, if what you're saying is a lot of Kabbalah is metaphoric, understand it. And yeah. And, 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 and some of it's very beautiful. I'm not, I'm not uh, attacking it. I'm right. 
And, and I'm not necessarily here to defend it. Yeah. I'm simply here to, to explain it. But, but I think that, the, you know, the fact that it, it, you know, has a certain anthropomorphic feel doesn't make it less acceptable any more than the, you know, mainstream rabbinic Judaism. And, and it gives us, who humans, who think as humans, a way to think of God. Yes. And, and that's okay. Yes. So hopefully, you know, and again, it, if this is something that works for you as a system, well and good. If it doesn't, there will be other questions that you will have to answer, but it's perfectly okay for you not to utilize it in the way that, that you, know, you approach God. So for instance, one of the critiques of mainstream Judaism is it's too philosophical sometimes. It doesn't provide enough direct access to God. Uh, you know, Kabbalah is definitely about really strong access to God. Right? So you may navigate towards one system or the other. The question is, you know, which one provides the right kind of and the amount of energy that's necessary to sustain um, you know, a, a Jewish way of life. Uh, and and uh, I'll, I, I, I don't want to devote a lot of time to this today, but, but I will say later on more about how historically Judaism has needed the energy both of a more philosophical approach to Judaism and a more mystical approach to Judaism that if we try to eliminate one or the other, we are gonna wind up with some problems. Um, and much of that has affected Western Jewry in the 19th and 20th century, certainly, uh, because uh, for a long time, most of us tried to do without um, the, um, the approach of the mystical tradition and people who needed that, who sought that, found that they didn't have an answer in most of our synagogues. So if that's your tendency, if that's your desire, then uh, maybe this provides part of an answer. Yes, Francois. Okay. So when we talk about that, 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 that dig below arouse the tzaddik above. So, so who is a tzaddik above? I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm not sure I understood you. Tzaddik above represent who? Yes. So, the tzaddik above is the righteous one, meaning God, as God is made manifest in the Sfirot. That's what the Shnei Luchot Habrit means here. Okay. And there is a response from that. When you, uh, when, when you provide energy from this end that sends a positive force into the cosmos, the cosmos then responds by sending down a supportive flow. Now you should have on your handouts um, a copy of this diagram, probably on the second page of the, um, the handout. I use the word handout advisedly, right? Take a page. Yes. So on that page, you have the diagram 
with the uh, with the spherot, right? Um, uh, there, you know, there's no visual way to precisely express the role of the spherot. So again, I, you know, just to caution you that, you know, all of this is to some degree metaphorical, uh, but hopefully the diagram helps you to understand the role of each of the spherot in their nature. Um, so, and, and we'll see in the next text, I wanna go through the diagram, but we'll see in the next text um, a lot more information about the spherot. Sometimes you will see a diagram of the spherot rendered in the form of a human body. Um, it, it's, um, you know, it's as if this were a picture of a divine body. Right? The, you know, this world is going to pattern on something that exists above. Right? That's a very radical concept in some ways, but, you know, because the human being is created in God's image. And so we also mirror the divine image. And that's what the, um, what that kind of diagram of the sphere wrote um, might help provide for us. Right? So a little bit of information about each of the sphere wrote. The top, you have the first svira, which is keter. Keter means crown. And it is called keter, not only because it is the highest of the spherot, but because it's often represented visually in the form of a body with a crown on top. Um, and in a way, it is also rendered uh, you know, above the head, suggesting that this is something that is completely incomprehensible. And so for that reason, it is sometimes referred to as ayin, which means nothingness, right? Down and to the right, the second sphira, chokma, meaning wisdom. This is where in a very abstract way, God's intellectual attributes begin to unfold. And it is a, a powerful force in the creative process. Uh, in accord with a verse from the 104th Psalm, which says, you know, Kulam b'chachma asita, you made them all with wisdom. Uh, and many of the sfirot are loosely associated with male or female qualities. Chochma is generally considered to be a masculine uh, sphira, sort of providing the seed for the spherot below. And to its left, you have the third sphira, bina. Bina meaning understanding. Uh, also sort of includes intuitive knowledge. Takes that wisdom from above, that untreated abstract wisdom and refines it, maybe making it useful in certain specific ways. Bina is considered a feminine force. It's often referred to as the womb because it also gives birth to all the spherot below, the spherot that are most affected by human actions. Down and to the right, the fourth sphira, chesed, chesed meaning love. Um, strangely enough, that, is, at least for some people, that is considered a masculine realm in Kabbalah. It is also identified with the biblical character of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham is one of the key biblical models of loving kindness. He's uh, the paragon of hospitality. So Chesed and Abraham go together. And sometimes in Kabbalistic texts, such as the Zohar, uh, Abraham becomes um, kind of a, a code 
uh, statement for uh, this sphira of chesed. Right? So the, the first three sphirot are more abstract and intellectual. Chesed begins the process of bringing about specific actions. And it is, you know, the, in, in rabbinic thought, you have two different aspects of God, midat harachamim, the quality of compassion, midat hadin, the quality of judgment, right? God is both, you know, loving, but also God sets rules and boundaries for us. So chesed is associated with the quality of compassion. And then to its left, you see the fifth svira, gvura. Gvura means power. Uh, it's often associated with din, with judgment. Right? Um, and this uh, svira is considered a feminine realm. Uh, the uh, translator of the Zohar, Danny Matt, uh, suggested that the author of the Zohar or whoever created this Kabbalistic system, must have had one hell of a mother. Um, maybe the mother uh, was, you know, more of a powerful character and less loving than we often like to think our mothers are. Um, so um, it, the, um, the fifth Sfi, Ragvura, is also identified with Isaac, right? Perhaps because it it takes a certain amount of power to restrain one's emotions. Isaac was able to restrain himself when he was bound upon the altar as a sacrifice. Gvura is also associated with God's quality of justice, of judgment. Uh, so it suggests the need for boundaries, the, the acceptance of uh, responsibility. Um, and I've, I've talked a little about the fact that um, chesed and gvura, we'll see this in other ways in the texts later on, chesed and gvura have to be carefully balanced. Um, they're both things that we need in the world, but if we get out of balance, if we have too much of one and not enough of the other, then that's when bad things come into the world uh, as a result of that imbalance. It's, it's just like, you know, if you bake a cake, it requires certain ingredients. Well, <laughs> it's all well and good to have the right ingredients, but they also have to be in the right proportions. Uh, otherwise, your cake is not going to come out the way you want. Um, those of you who are parents, and have raised children, you should understand this very well because you had to raise kids with both love and with rules, with boundaries. Hopefully you, you, you had a good balance because um, there's enough problems even when you raise them with a good balance, um, let alone if you are um, out of balance. Next, the sixth svira, very important one, Tiferet, glory or beauty. Uh, and that kind of mediates those, those two uh, svirot above. It's sort of like the mixer where those two things get refined and synthesized. Generally, Tiferet is seen as a masculine quality. Um, it is associated with Jacob. Jacob is seen as the synthesis of his father and grandfather. Tiferet is also associated with the Torah Shebichtav, the written Torah. Okay. Um, seven and eight, Netzach and Hod. Netzach means eternity or victory. This is, this is the level where some of these more abstract qualities get put into direct practice. Hod, splendor, uh, and Netzach are often portrayed as the legs of the body that are formed by the Sfirot, uh, because the legs take us where we need to go to perform whatever actions uh, we do. And they draw upon the Sfirot from above. 
Netzach represents God as compassionate king. Hod is the powerful king. Again, you have this, uh, this discrepancy uh, and the balance that you have to have between love and power. Netzach and Hod are also considered to be the source of prophecy. So they are associated with Moses and Aaron. And you can see that these are the levels that are beginning to be a little more approachable, uh, a little more connected to um, this world as we experience it. <coughs> Number nine, um, yesod. Yesod means foundation. Sometimes yesod is called tzaddik righteous. Why? Because there is a verse in Proverbs that says, Sadiq Yesod Olam, the righteous is the foundation of the world. Yesod is also associated with Joseph, who is referred to as the righteous one in rabbinic tradition. Yesod is associated with the sexual organ. Joseph was the one who is most associated with withstanding sexual temptation, right? Because of the story with Potiphar's wife. He resists her uh, desire to, uh, to have him. Right? Um, in a sense, it is Yesod that bestows the seed from up above down to the last sphira and through it, to the entire world. And then Sfira number 10 is Malchut. Malchut is often referred to as Shekhinah, the divine dwelling place. Now all the Sfirot are dwelling places for God, but Malchut is the place where it's most accessible to us as human beings, right? So that it's kind of our portal to the divine realm. Um, and Malchut as such always had a, a special fascination for the mystics. It's like that, you know, that totality from the system above kind of lands in one place where in a way it, it, it becomes more accessible to us. Right? But it's still part of God, so you can't know it fully, uh, it is also associated with the oral Torah, the Torah Sheba al -Peh, the oral traditions derived from the written Torah. And very importantly, it is considered to be a feminine force, uh, and it has to link with Tiferet in order for the Svirotic system to function properly. In other words, if you send up you know, good actions, good thoughts into the system, into the cosmos, then that keeps the system functioning as a clear channel. What happens if you send sin up into the system? Right? So that prevents things from working well. Uh, and then you need repentance, which is sort of like the, uh, the Drano that clears out all of the system. Right? Um, clears out all the gunk that sin creates. And so, if Tiferet and Malchut, or Shekhinah, are able to unite because the system is clear and free from sin, that's a metaphor for saying, ah, oh, yes, you know, that's when the world works well. That's when everything is in balance. And if they're not able to unite, then that's a way of telling you that things are not right in the world and this he wrote cannot function as they should. So I want to, I, have, I could say a lot more about this he wrote, but I've given you a little bit of an outline. Uh, so in the uh, 
time that we have left, um, uh, let me um, uh, ask for uh, any questions or comments that you might have. Danny, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, are all the Spiro considered equal? And a corollary sort of question to that, why are the ones that are in the center and the center, are those more like the core Spiro? Uh-huh. Okay, so that's a great question. Let me take the second one first. Um, yeah, it, in a way, the the ones uh, in the center have special significance for the system. Um, uh, it's almost as if they are uh, connection points. It's like you know, if if you are the person who is operating all the trains going into Grand Central Station or any train station. You know, and they have to be, you know, they have to run from different tracks, right? So you got to make sure that uh, the trains all go in the right place. The central sphere road fulfill that function for the entire system. They send things out into the right places and they collect things from the right places. Okay, so then are certain things more important than others? Um, they are all critical. They all play an important role. Um, but some of them are more like those connecting points. So, you know, yeah, in general, the ones that in the, are in the center are the ones that you are going to hear a great deal about in Kabbalistic text. Not always. <laughs> Whatever I tell you, there are exceptions uh, because I mean, the balance between the you know those that are side by side is critically important. Just like you know. Chesed and Gvura have to be born out in ordinary life. They're born out in the Kabbalistic realm as well. Okay? Okay, good. Other questions? Comments? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, Let's then start on the next text in your in your handout. Oh, one one other thing about the Sfirot that I did I didn't mention, and that is just how we relate to them and how they they relate to each other. Somebody suggested the analogy of bumper cars, right? which is probably a, a much more accurate way of looking at than this you know, very nicely cut and dry diagram of the Svi road and how they interact, right? Um, we human beings have invisible lines through which we relate to the Svi road and our actions bump into other forces in the world, just like bumper cars bump into each other. And you know, the bumper car is also reactive. It's moved by other forces. And so are we. And therefore, so are these divine forces, these spherot. Uh, they're, they all constantly affect each other. Our actions provide things to react to. They're just like, you know, bumper effects. And the spherot are bumper cars that get you know, moved around or affected by uh, our actions. Okay? Maybe that, that analogy will be helpful for some people. Um, 
Okay, any other comments or questions? So let's go into the next um, text. Right? Um, in the Zohar, which is, I've talked about it a little bit in previous sessions, but just to relate, this is a book, this is a, a vast collection of teachings that appears around the year 1280. Okay. Uh, in Spanish Kabbalistic circles. Okay. Um, Tikkune HaZohar is probably one of the late Kabbalistic texts, later at least than the Zohar itself. Okay. And this little piece from Tikkune HaZohar deals with Elijah. The hero in much of the Zohar is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, uh, the second century uh, scholar and mystic. He's the chief character in the Zohar. Um, but in this text, Rabbi Shimon and his colleagues and students are visiting the Heavenly Academy. So who runs the heavenly academy? Well, other than God, right? Uh, Elijah is um, kind of a go-between for, for those of us who try to approach the heavenly academy. Elijah, of course, is this, you know, character whose own life is sort of mystical because he doesn't die like a normal person, right? He's carried up to heaven in a chariot of fire. Um, I don't know that I would survive a chariot of fire, but apparently, you know, Elijah's kind of a go-between between the two worlds. Here and there, he pops up in our world. Um, uh, you know, certainly in mainstream rabbinic literature, and here he's the uh, instructor for Shimon Bar Yochai and his colleagues. It says, Master of Worlds, you are one, but are not numbered. You are higher than the highest, hidden within all secrets, utterly incomprehensible. Now, those of you who were with us when we talked about the Ein Sof, which is above the whole Kabbalistic system, that, this, that which is infinite, the, the infinite, unchanging nature of God. The Ein Sof is one, but not in number. Right? If God were, were one in number, that would imply the existence of a series of numbers. And the, the Kabbalist who authors this text says the Ein Sof is just itself. It's just its essence. It doesn't have any attributes, doesn't have any qualities. Okay? So that's the starting point for what will be this extended reflection on uh, the nature of the Svirot, which we will approach and study together, hopefully, next week. And uh, I'm going to stay on for a few minutes, so if any of you have other questions you want to ask, feel free. But we're, we're really at the end of our time, so I'm going to let all of you go. Um, I'll stay on for just a few minutes for questions. Okay. So thank you all for joining with me um, virtually, and uh, we'll see you the same time next week. Thank you, Rabbi. It was wonderful. Thank you, Roberto. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very good. Thank okay. you. Rabbi Denny, so Ein Sof is actually above the Keter. Yes, Francois. I mean, there are Kabbalistic models that identify them, but for the most part in the Zohar, uh, you see it as above okay. um, Keter. Perfect. So, you know, what I like about the description of Keter as a whale, which is awesome because, you know, everything starts with whale, like even as a human, as us, when we, before we do something, it's about the will. So it's kind of like the same concept um on the top on the high level yes okay
Yeah. So, you know, in a, in a way, looking at the way we decide certain things is a good metaphor for how, um, uh, you know, how the Kabbalist thinks of uh, the upper sphere road. What, what would be, sorry, what would be the real definition of sefirot? Sefirot are emanations, okay? Now, that word in itself may not be clear, so let me try to define it, okay? Um, an emanation is something that flows forth, okay? Oh. So, from God's essence, there flow different realms representing different aspects and qualities of God. That's what the Sphirot are. And that it, that it, help? Yeah, and that's what connects us uh, to God. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, if, you know, if you understand those aspects of God, they give you um, a way to relate to God a little better. Okay. I got it now. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I just wanted to offer, uh, if you'd like to, uh, I can share my screen and you can see the sphere out diagram on the human body, a la uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, <laughs> I'd be happy to share if, uh, oh, I can't share my screen, so. Um, here's one but it, it should be on that on, on the second page of the handout. Well, it's uh, the spirit are on the second page of the handout, just not diagrammed on the human body. Oh, yeah, right. Um, you know Janice, what? I, if you will I just send that opened me, it up, I will try to have it for uh, for us for next time. There it is. Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> well, interesting. Yes. That, that's, uh, you know, one version of how this often appears. But this is for Michelangelo or Leonardo. Hey, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Yes. Leonardo. <laughs> the reason I, I like it mapped on the human body is that when you were talking about how, um, you know, one part of the system needs the other part of the system to function, it's like, you know, the, the right side of our body you know, needs the left side of the body to function. And if we don't have all of that functioning in balance, then we are, you know, out of balance. And that's, right. You, and that's, you know, if, if, if you cut off the left side of your body, you would be without a heart. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this is, uh, you know, um, it's also useful because, as I said, if you... As a human being, if you are created in God's image, then, you know, this gives you a, a way to understand God, even knowing that God is not a human being. Exactly. I mean, it, and, and I mean, it, it comes back to what Francois said, you know, the Ain Sof, or not even the Ain Sof is that without name, that without end, that without, that we can't even comprehend. And yeah. so this gives it, us in a way, by the way, it, it's really not accurate to say the Ain Sov, exactly. as if there were a possibility of some other Ain Sov. <laughs> exactly. That's why I corrected myself. Danny? Yes. Question: When you were uh, answering Roberto's question about the spherot and and what they are and emanations, uh, so uh, and and that um, there were different ways to connect with God in two directions, up and down, or in and out. Do is is the I'll call it the theory. Um, of the spherot that in order for us to uh, to receive an emanation, that it has to come down from whichever sphera it is 
through ultimately through Mahut, or is there a way to directly connect with Chesed? No, it all has to go through the system, um, which is why sin is such a big problem, because you can't shortcut the plumbing of the system. If the system gets gunked up, then, um, you know, you will not have access to God at all. So if there was a, uh, something from Chesed that we want, were to experience, it wouldn't necessarily have to come through Tiferet. It could come through Netzach to Yisod, to Malchut, to us. Um, you can bypass. Except, no, it, it, just, just the opposite. Everything flows down the system. Well, the connect, it shows us that there is a direct connection from Chesed to Netzach. And yes, not just through but. Yeah, in other words, all parts of the system connect to everything else. But if there is a blockage somewhere in the system, it will ruin the whole system. Much as if you have one artery in your body that is clogged up, that will cause a problem, even though there are multiple arteries for, you know, through, through which things can go. Now, if you get a blockage, sooner or later, it's gonna bite you. That makes sense. Mm. Human body is a, fur a, a fertile metaphor for these things. Yeah, Janice. I'd like to ask you about another diagram that actually <coughs> is also from David Zaslow that actually uh, shows a flow of the um, spirit from Keto to Hochma to Bina to Chesed to Gavura. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a whole different system that and you're talking about the four worlds as they function with the Ten Sfi Road. Uh, this comes into Kabbalah a little bit later. You don't really see much about four worlds in the Zoharic literature. So uh, I'm going to treat that probably next year. We'll... Um, you know, this class is, is going to continue, um, you know, we, we, hopefully <laughs> we'll be virtual through the spring and maybe at some point we'll resume live classes and, um, and then um, in, in the fall when we resume, um, at some point we'll be able to pick up uh, the system of uh, the four worlds. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much. And um, thank you, Rabbi, God willing, we'll, we'll all be together, sort of, next week. <laughs> thank you. Virtually, thank you, Rabbi. Virtually together. Okay. All right. Bye. Shalom of Bye. Bye.